Hello everyone, my name is Sum Ho Lim. I am a postdoc at Nogita, an institute hosted by KTH and Stockholm University. Today I would like to tell you about our recent work on understanding recurrent neural networks using response theory. As we know, sequential data are everywhere. These data are basically sequences where the order of elements matters. The elements can be repeated themselves, and the number of elements can even be infinite or vary. The natural question is how to model and learn sequential data. It turns out that recurrent neural networks are specially designed to handle the sequential nature of these data. They are brain-inspired models in machine learning and neuroscience. It is useful to think of them as open dynamical systems, especially when the sequences are time series. Here, open is in the sense that uh, the systems are interacting with external uh, signal or data. We will focus mainly on supervised learning frameworks in this talk. So to begin with, let's suppose that we are given data of the following form and uh, consider using uh, RNN models described by the following non-autonomous district time parametric system. In these outdated equations, the variable h denote the so-called hidden state, which encode all the information of uh, the sequential data, and y denote the output variable. A simple example of RNN is the so-called vanilla RNN, where the function a is given by hyperbolic tangent applied component-wise, and the function f is linear in which Here, the matrices w, u, v, and the vector b constitutes the learnable parameters. There are also other more complicated examples, such as equal state networks, uh, the popular LSTM and GRU, and the more recent innovations of anti-symmetric RNN and sleek stick RNN. Uh, the loss functions uh, is typically chosen to be empirical loss functions. And um, to do optimizations, we uh, minimize these loss functions. For example, using stochastic gradient descent and back propagations to time. So I hope this tells you um, the basics of RNMs. Next, I would like to walk you uh, from RNMs to SDEs, step by step. So the first step is uh, the following observations. It turns out that we can transform uh, RNMs into input-affine input RNM. So what do I mean by this? So by introducing additional state variables and corresponding inputs, we can basically term um, RNM, um, which uh, read the A is non-linear in H and U into a new RNM where the U is pulled out from the non-linearity. So then um, we have input of five uh, of the equations for the hidden states. Next, we are going to add a leaky integrator or what we call um, the so-called damping term as follows. And then we are going to inject noise into the hidden states of the RNM as follows. For example, the simplest um, type of noise that we can think of is uh, a Gaussian noise. There are uh, various reasons and benefits for uh, injecting noise. On the point of view of machine learning, injecting noise allows regularizations and stability. Um, from uh, the point of view of uh, biological networks, 
noise is always there, so it is a natural procedure in modeling. And also, you can think of uh, noise here as um, a source of noise um, for the input sequence due to, for example, measurement error and so on. So if we uh, look at these equations a bit closely and choosing the um, noise to be IID standard Gaussian random variable, we arrive at essentially uh, the euler marurama approximation of stochastic differential equations. Uh, here. So to recap, here we have, um, so we went from this, um, the original IIM model to the continuous time um, SDE model. So um, more generally, we are going to consider the following um, continuous time SDE model for RNN, which we call um, SRNNs. So essentially, the hidden state of these SRNNs are basically described by stochastic differential equations of uh, the following form. So um, the drift term in the SDE consists of three distinct terms. The first term is sort of like a damping term where the matrix gamma is positive stable. The second term is a nonlinear function A, uh, which we should, shall call activation function. And the last one is um, the input signal uh, that drive the SDE. So obviously we are interested in the output of SRNN and in particular the following output functional, which is basically expectation of an observable F um, yeah, evaluated at um, the hidden state or at the terminal time, capital T. So with this, we would like to answer um, the following two fundamental questions concerning uh, recurrent neural networks. The first one is, how does the output produced by these networks respond to a driving input signal over time? The second one is, is there a universal mechanism underlying the response? In this talk, we will try to address the above questions using the response theory originated in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. And to make our life easy, uh, we will simply consider scalar uh, output functional. So we are going to set P equal to one uh, from now on. So before we um, go on further, I would like to emphasize a useful uh, viewpoint, i.e. we can view SRNN as input per two dynamical systems. So recall that, uh, so here, T alpha here is our original uh, model for SRNN, which is perturbed by uh, the signal U. We can consider the corresponding unperturbed um, systems where the U is set to zero. So in this sense, we can think of the H as a perturbation of Hirsch bar, which comes from this unperturbed SDE here. So when we talk about SDEs, it's useful to work with uh, generators and transition operators. So here I will um, walk you through the notations that I use for generators and transition operators. So I will denote the generators of um, the, these two processes by um, L and L0, respectively. And the transition operator, um, I will denote this by P, X, T. And um, for the transition operator for the amplitude dynamics, there's a P0 there. And uh, it's in fact a Marco semi-group. 
Of course, we can also uh, look at the um, L2 adjoint of the above generators and transition operators from the space of probability measures. And the notations that we use here is that, so for the adjoint generator, we are going to uh, denote them by A and A0 for the amplitude uh, dynamics. And for the adjoint transition operators, we use P star and uh, P0 star for the amplitude uh, dynamics. And we assume that the initial measure and law of these processes have a density with respect to the Bay measure. So, all right. Um, so now um, I'm going to introduce how we can use response theory to um, analyze SR and M. So recall that this uh, is the SDE uh, that define the hidden state of the SR and M. So the key idea of response theory is that if the amplitude of the input signal is small enough, we can um, work with asymptotic expansions um, for the density, uh, the probability density uh, of associated to the SDE. So in particular, we can see uh, perturbative expansions for um, the probability density in epsilon as follows. So then if you plot this um, answer uh, of uh, expansion into the focal plane equations and then match the orders in epsilon, we arrive at the following hierarchy of equations. And if we solve these uh, equations, um, we see that the higher order terms, rho n, can and in fact be related recursively via uh, the following relations. So then if everything works out nicely, um, then um, we get the following asymptotic expansions for the probability density um, associated to the SDE. And we can do the same thing for uh, not just the density, but also the observable associated to the SDE. In, and in particular, in response theory, it is um, useful to look at two types of averages. So the first average is the average respect to per two dynamics. And the second one is the average respect to the unperturbed dynamics. And um, so we are going to look at the difference between these two averages for an observable. And um, so using what we have just now, we can transfer this and uh, obtain the following um, asymptotic expansions for the um, expectation of, of an observable. So um, to make our life easy, again, uh, I'm going to take uh, the, the, the observable F is center respect to the initial density. So now we are going to look at um, each term in the uh, asymptotic expansions. So the first order term, um, so n with one here, fall into the region of linear response uh, in the sense that um, the resulting um, expressions will be linear in uh, the inputs. So after some um, computations, we can see that the first order term is essentially a convolution term of the following form. Uh, with the kernel, um, so that I call uh, first order response kernel, uh, given essentially by averages respect to the initial uh, density of a function of only the amplitude dynamics. And uh, this is essentially the attractive part of using response theory. And um, we can see that, um, so these equations here is actually uh, non-equilibrium fluctuation dissipation relations of Agawa type, um, which has been already studied by uh, statistical physicists in the 70s. And in the special case of stationary invariant distributions, we can recover the so-called uh, equilibrium 
potential anticipation relations. Now, um, going beyond the linear response, um, so we can look at higher order response for n equal to two, three, and so on. And again, after some um, derivations, we arrive at the following uh, representation for the output functional of S R and N. So basically, uh, this is a series of generalized convolution integrals. Um, again, there are kernels here, um, but these kernels are defined recursively um, via uh, these formulas. So the, the key observation is that um, these kernels completely determine um, the output functional and they only depends on the amplitude dynamics of the SRN. So this gives us the answer to questions one that uh, we raised just now. So, um, so I call these uh, memory representations in the sense that um, here we have a kernel which is time dependent. So um, now can we derive another type of representations? So um, let's assume that um, the eigenfunction function expansion of the generator corresponding to the amplitude part A0 exists and is well defined. So for example, if A0 is symmetric, so then we can consider um, eigenfunction function expansions of A0 uh, here for the um, kernels, inside the kernels here. And if we, after this, if we expand the exponentials that appear, um, we can derive from um, the memory representation, the following memory loss representations. So um, this representation is essentially telling us that the output functional can be represented as linear combinations of uh, uh, iterator integrals of some interesting um, structure here. Uh, so you see in these iterator integrals, there are terms like um, time to some power multiplied by um, the, some, the component of the input u. And, um, and then we basically sum this out and then we arrive at the output functional. So what this tells us also is that um, it, this entangles the input signal from the SRN uh, architecture systematically. So, so far what we have seen um, are formal derivations of two type of representations and um, with a bit of more work, we can make sense of them rigorously um, by um, formulations um, of the so-called response functions. So um, you can just think of these response functions as some um, um, uh, n order functional derivative of the output functional with respect to um, the input signal. So these are, again, uh, functional derivative. And um, to make this rigorous, of course, we need to consider appropriate uh, test function space and um, define them by considering the actions on test functions. So this is basically uh, what we have here. And the intuition behind these response functions is that, um, let's say that we look at the linear response case and take the test functions uh, phi here to be a direct delta functions, then uh, the first order response functions is essentially uh, the rate of change of uh, the output functional f subject to the small impulsive perturbation at an earlier time. And similarly, we, we can see that the higher order response functions will give us higher order rate of change. And if we sum all these out, we can basically um, determine the full effect of the perturbations on the upper functionals F, order by order. 
And here uh, there are some technical details, but the essential idea is that uh, if we uh, were under certain assumptions that make everything nice enough and, um, and so on, then we can um, justify uh, this rate of change and compute them in fact. So here is um, one result of the computation. So we can um, have, you can have this formula for the n order response functions, which uh, itself is, is interesting, but um, does not tell us um, anything insightful. But if we um, work uh, a bit more, uh, especially if you assume um, the, the initial density is positive, then we can rewrite um, the earlier formula here as um, correlation functions of the observable and uh, conjugate observable respect to the unperturbed dynamics that I call V, uh, v here. Um, so there are a few remarks concerning this uh, result. So again, in the linear response regime, um, which is the simplest case uh, here, and if uh, the unperturbed dynamics is stationary, and if we restrict to reversible diffusions, in which case the drift part can be um, written as negative grading of some uh, potential functions, then um, 40 is basically um, equilibrium fluctuation dissipation theorem. And in the more general nonlinear response regime, we can think of the observable V um, basically as a nonlinear counterparts of conjugate observables mentioned earlier in um, the linear response regime. And so it's natural to call them higher order conjugate observables. And um, it turns out also that these conjugate observables are uniquely determined. All right, so uh, now um, going back to the memory representations. So under the formalism that we just outlined uh, just now, um, we can make sense of this uh, memory representation um, in a mathematical rigorous way as follows. So it turns out that um, the memory representation is, uh, can be made sense as a convergent Volterra series. Uh, which you can simply think of as a Taylor series on some functional space. And then um, for the second representations, we can make sense of it um, as the following um, convergence series expansions uh, under the assumptions that the operator A0 makes a well-defined agent function expansion. So the nice thing about this representation is that, um, again, it tells us that iterator integrals are really uh, the, the features that we care about. And the output functionals of S, R, and N are essentially linear combinations of these iterator integrals. And in particular, the coefficients here, the A, uh, P0, P, N, uh, extract away all the details of memory induced by S R N M. Um, and uh, just as a side remark, you can also uh, derive uh, these representations for compositions of multiple um, S R N Ns. And this, um, so um, the composition compositions will preserve these uh, representations. And interestingly, um, the response kernels, uh, the resulting response kernels, can be expressed in terms of exponential Bell polynomials. So now, um, going further uh, into something a bit more abstract, but um, also interesting in the sense that we uh, can learn more about structure of uh, this iterator integrals is um, let's consider lifting um, the input signal to a tensor algebra space 
that I will introduce later. Uh, the idea is that I'm going to link uh, the memory loss representation that we saw earlier to the notion of path integral. So for those of you who are not familiar with path integral, uh, path signature, sorry. Uh, so path signature is a central object in graph path theory, a theory that provides elegant and robust uh, nonlinear extension of the classical theory of differential equations driven by irregular signals such, such as uh, Brownian paths. And uh, in particular, um, this theory allows for deterministic treatment of SDEs. So we are not going to go into uh, the details of this theory, but I will just tell you um, just enough uh, to understand what path signature is and how it relates uh, to the iterator integrals that we saw earlier. So um, to make things um, easy and um, meaningful, we are going to just consider um, path or bounded variations. So um, before this, let's, there are some um, formal um, definitions that we need to go over so that we can understand what is going on next. So um, let's first fix a Banach space E and consider the following space of formal series of tensors of E. So now um, for a path of bounded variations, by the signature of this path, we mean the following element um, of uh, the above space. So essentially these are basically collections of iterator integrals. And um, you can basically work in suitable basis and write them um, explicitly as follows. Or you can consider uh, the dual picture. So here are some examples uh, to help us understand more about this path signature. So in the case of um, when the path X is just one dimensional, the N level signature is basically um, the N power of the increments of the path. And when X is E value linear path, um, instead of uh, being N power, we have an n for tensor product. And um, so this is going to be useful later. If x is piecewise linear path, for example, by um, concatenating L linear path, um, then uh, the signature of um, this piecewise linear path uh, have the following um, representations in terms of the exponentials of uh, the increments between the endpoints. So now going back to the memoryless representations that we saw earlier, it turns out that we can express uh, this representation in terms of signature of um, some appropriately transformed path. So this is the XP, uh, which is essentially the tensor product of the original input signal U with uh, a vector whose components are monomials in time T. So basically this is just a reformulation of the earlier memoryless representations in terms of signature of appropriate time lifted uh, path. So um, here are a few remarks concerning signature. So it turns out that uh, the signature is a universal feature set in the sense that any continuous map can be approximated by a linear functional of signature of the input signal. And recently uh, the signature has uh, been used in um, various machine learning frameworks, in particular um, by the group of uh, Leoms in Oxford. 
Next, uh, the above theorem also, um, so this is basically what I mentioned earlier, right? So the output functional of SINMs emit a linear representation in terms of signature of, um, so um, this is what I call the time lifted input signal here, XE. So we are going to call this signature um, the response feature. Um, since we uh, have just made the connections with, uh, with the response theory, so it's a bit, uh, so it's kind of natural to call uh, them uh, response features, which again is nothing but uh, collections of iterator integrals of uh, time lifted part here. So um, before we move on further, uh, in fact, I'm going to try to connect uh, these representations to kernels and reproducing kernel hyperspace. But before continuing, I would like to remind you um, what we meant by kernel and the associated reproducing kernel hyperspace. So these are the definitions. So the key things that we need to remember are that um, kernels are basically positive definites. So for example, um, inner products, and that um, every kernel can be associated with a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And in fact, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between kernels and uh, these spaces. So now, um, we are going to link the memory list representations uh, in terms of signature just now to some suitable kernel. So consider the following Hilbert space, um, which is a tensor product of um, these um, appropriately written L2 space sequences of the form uh, as follow and um, Rm. So this, there are some technical liquids here, but um, let's not worry too much about this. Simply think of them as um, some appropriate space that we will need later um, to make sense of um, everything precisely. So the, the key thing here is really um, that I call kernel induced by signature, which is nothing but the inner product of uh, between um, uh, signatures of um, signature of uh, time lifted signal here, and um, we can show that basically this object is a kernel over um, this Hilbert space here, and then there's a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space associated to uh, this kernel. So now let's go back to supervised learning framework that we saw earlier, but we a little bit of uh, changes here. So now um, we are going to work on path, same space of path with bounded variations. And for the learning model, we are going to take the kernel model where um, we have these expansions, kernel expansions here where the kernel um, is induced by signature of the time lifted path. And we are going to consider a slightly more general optimization problem with uh, regularization. And uh, with all this, um, we can formulate a representer theorem. Um, so in the sense that um, we can show that any solution to the optimization problem with a suitable hypothesis space amid the kernel expansions of the following form. And uh, again, um, recall that S here uh, is a signature of um, a time lifted uh, input signal. And um, so, so far we have been working on, um, so working with input signals, they are um, continuous. So let's say that 
instead that we have um, district time point, uh, district data points, um, where uh, if we join them, um, we get a continuous path. For example, by doing linear interpolation on these data points. Then um, if we consider uh, this um, path that are joined by linear interpolation, we can also formulate a representative theorem um, for uh, learning problem with these paths. So um, the key idea of this theorem is that it shows us the optimal solutions of uh, the optimization problem live in a SAR space with dimensions at most the number of training examples. And in the case of part B here, it also shows us how the solutions depends on the number of samples in the example. So um, to conclude, uh, let us recap what we have seen so far. So first we have seen that uh, RNNs are special instances of sRNNs that we consider here. And um, we have been able to characterize how the output of sRNN respond to input signal in a systematic order by order manner using the response theory from statistical mechanics. This gives us two types of representations for um, the output functional that we consider here. The first one is the so-called memory representations. It can be made sense as Volterra series. The second one is the memoryless representations, which is essentially a linear combinations of a set of iterator integrals. And we managed to link um, these representations to the signature of an appropriately time lifted signal. And we, uh, from these um, representations, we saw that uh, the so called response features, which again, it, uh, they are just iterated integrals. So they are the universal building blocks in which uh, the network extracts information from when processing the input signal. Finally, we uh, formulated representative theorems. And um, so in, in this sense, um, uh, the theorem tells us that we can view uh, the networks as kernel machines operating on a suitable with producing kernel fiber space. So I hope this talk um, gives us um, some idea of how um, uh, the SRNM process the input signal. And if you want to um, know the details of what we cover here, feel free to um, check out our paper here. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>